So uh, my name is Sean Mertinger, and I'm going to talk to you today a little bit about uh, medical device security. Uh, I've been doing security for about 10 years. I started out with Cisco Systems, doing internal product security assessment, uh, worked with Tipping Point, did some independent stuff. Done a bunch of conferences. I've done VoIP uh, phones, uh, reported a lot of vulnerabilities in those, and door access controllers. I did that kind of a couple of years ago on that. Right now, I work at the University of Florida Academic Health Center. Anybody here work at a university? Uh, academic uh, Health Center, anyone? Really inter interesting places to work. A lot of research going on in these locations, and they're medical students and dental students. Very, very cool place. I've gotten lucky there. I'm kind of an individual contributor, and I work with uh, multiple teams. I work with uh, networking teams and uh, security teams, so I'm not really a security guy there, but uh, it's a... Uh, it's a, kind of an interesting role. I'm also working on a second master's. So uh, my goals today, basically, I, I try not to read off the slides. I mean, I try to make it pretty clear. You can you know, go through these, but the, you know, I just want to give you a better idea. It's real limited, you know, with a half hour time of uh, you know what I can cover. So um, you know, I'll give you some ideas about you know, what's, who's doing research now, what some of the current <coughs> issues are. I get some good ideas here for your own research um, and where you can make a, a splash and a difference on your own here too. And uh, definitely I want to uh, reiterate here is the MedSec group on LinkedIn. I started that a couple years ago. Uh, I have about almost 300 people on there and we've got everyone from hospitals, CISOs, to uh, vendors, to uh, uh, lead security researchers. It's a really interesting uh, group of folks on there and uh, it's, we still have been able to keep it fairly technical so I definitely recommend you join that. Anybody here been in a hospital recently? Um, you know, for a family or had an operation or anything um, they've changed tremendously over the past uh, you know 10 20 years but especially in the past five years I mean they're, they're just really technology rich environments there's a huge no you don't even see the wireless here and the whole wireless is a, is, a, is a completely different aspect but this is what you'll see in a modern hospital room and uh, you know a previous speaker said you know doctors and uh, aren't really technical. I'd say that's true in small businesses and small operations, but you get into some of these uh, larger operations and the doctors are familiar with the technology and uh, they, they want to use it. They're really, really eager to, to use this technology. So medical networks themselves can be extremely complicated. Uh, this is just a, a generic, well not really a generic, but a good diagram of uh, you know, what's going on out there, what you can see, and some of these Key areas to focus in here are this, you know, this body area network, and uh, it's interesting. Just this past week on NPR, there was a, a story about um, uh, medical devices which they'll implant into you, and then they'll actually dissolve over time. So those, these are electrical, electronic components that will uh, biodegrade in your body over time. So this is, you know, where we're going with this technology. So it's quite amazing. Imagine a Wi-Fi chip in your body that, you know, will actually just disappear. In a year or two, or however long. But these devices are these networks are, are terribly complex, and there's a lot of uh, stuff going on here as far as you know, different protocols and devices and uh, operating systems and uh, applications. It's it's pretty hairy at times. I'm, I'm surprised it even works. So what exactly are we talking about when we're talking about medical devices? I mean, some are obvious, right? You know, something you put in your body in an implant that's clearly a medical device. Insulin pumps, uh, radiation devices, sure, but it, it gets a little grayer when you start talking about software and applications and uh, even electronic health records. An electronic medical record system is something that's usually for a small hospital, a self-contained system. Electronic uh, health record system is usually um, a larger system and it has uh, interactivity uh, with other uh, health systems. So that's kind of the difference between EHR and EMR. This is Dick Cheney's new heart, and uh, you all know that he had this replaced a few years back. Give me an idea, you know, this is, has his system controller down here, uh, and this is external to his body, but you know, that runs an operating system, it gets updates, it, it, it controls this whole uh, contraption that, that he has in, in, inside him. But uh, you know, this is where we're going with this technology. That's a great, that's a great picture. <laughs> so anybody here follow any SCADA? Um, vulnerabilities, anybody on SCADA SEC mailing lists? So, you know, there's a lot of parallels, I think, here with SCADA. And, you know, we're talking about like specialized devices, they're building on, on commercial off the shelf uh, systems, and, uh, you know, life or death, right? Critical operations, vendor maintained, not designed to be patched. 
know, you run into these things with uh, with medical devices. What's really interesting about medical devices is that they're not always big vendors. There's lots of niche players in, in this marketplace. So you'll have you know a vendor maybe only has 20 employees and they make a really specific device. And you can imagine how difficult it is for them to not only have to go through all the regulatory processes, which is a really onerous process, and then have to worry about the security ramifications as well. I've been harping on this for about a year now. I think we're really looking at a, a lost decade in, uh, in, in medical device security, and uh, specifically healthcare security. And if uh, you want some background on that, look at this, the SCADA, uh, this digital bond SCADA block. They're a great um, essay on that. This should make you feel really good, right? <laughs> you know, a picture like this. You just have the physician connecting over the internet to a, you know, a server, and then going to a base station, uh, to a, a wireless device. Theoretical. Right, but in actuality, this is what's going on here. So this is what's called an Intel PHS 6000. It's actually a shipping device, and they're in trials right now or over in Europe, but they don't have one of these over, or they don't have this in the U.S. yet. But you know, your grandmother, your aging parents, um, you yourselves, as uh, you get older, um, will be having these in your homes, and you can really expect to see this kind of stuff. And you're going to be hooking up, you know, a blood pressure cuff. You'll do your vitals. You'll do self vitals. You have a uh, a doctor-patient uh, video conference over this thing. It'll send you reminders to say, hey, could you take your medication, you know, a little audible alarm. Some really great things and, and utility out of having a device like this, but, you know, again, if you're going to hook it up to your cable modem, you know, there needs to be real steps to take in to, to secure it. But this is the direction this is going. And with these healthcare costs skyrocketing, the, 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 there's a real drive out there to, to push down these costs and that and this is the way that they're going to do it, one of the, one of the many ways. So from an industry security awareness standpoint, and there's a, people have known about this issue for years. And when I see issue, I mean security issues in general. There have been working groups, there have been academic consortia uh, over the years, and great stuff, but nobody's got a stick. Nobody can tell these vendors what to do. Um, there's really no regulation at this point. Some regulation, but it's mostly with the marketing of the device, not really the security aspects of it. Patching, FDA issued guidance for uh, uh, commercial off-the-shelf software back in 2005, but there's still a lot of questions about, you know, can our hospital IT staff actually patch this device that is, you know, maybe a Windows 2000 box, but it's actually doing medical, it's actually a medical device because of the application software on here. Hospital staff are really, IT staff are really reluctant to go in and, work and mess with that box, you know, because something might break, and then we're talking serious liability. They don't have insight into all the operations of that box and how that works and what a patch is going to do. Same thing with antivirus. You know, you put on an antivirus on a, on a medical device, it blocks a port, you know, then there's no, uh, you know, that, that data isn't going back to whatever system it is. So IT hospital staffs are very, very cagey about uh, patching any systems. And some systems will say, sure, sure, we'll patch that, you know, because it just receives data. But anything that's connected to a medical device itself is, uh, is uh, very, very problematic. You'll see those with like computer on wheels, you know, those cow carts and stuff in hospitals. Software quality is a real problem still. Recent report, there was 24% of uh, FDA recalls were because of software failure. So that was some bug and whatever it was. Another report was uh, uh, clocks in medical devices. I mean, it was something like 20% of them were up to five minutes off. Uh, there's more independent study on, ongoing with that with uh, a few doctors. Interference. <laughs> I mentioned this earlier with uh, hospitals being really uh, you know, wireless uh, rich spaces. There's a lot of interference among these devices. My own place where I work, I mean, we've got RFID, we've got Zigbee, We've got uh, HVAC systems and stuff shooting wireless across and talking to each other. And of course, we've got tons of different, you know, uh, uh, Wi-Fi, A, B, uh, you know, G, N. It's, it's pretty scary. And then, you know, of course, the complexity that comes with this. What's really unnerving to me recently is seeing these medical devices start to get connected to the electronic health record systems. So what you're going to see now is, like, especially this is the case with uh, these things called infusion pumps. Anybody know what an infusion pump is? Great. So you know these are hooked up to you. 
when you need to get a regular dosage of medication and uh, they have the medication in there that's going in through an IV into you and there's a regular scheduled drop or you know dosage that's administered to you. When these are connected up with EHRs, that electronic health record, doctor may go in there and say, okay, you know, give this drip, you know, of this amount of medication at this time. And then that's wirelessly or over TCP, you know, Ethernet, whatever, going to that medical device, to that infusion pump, and then initiating that drip to you. So that's where we're going to see this command and control coming from EHRs, these devices. Consumer grade gear, iPads, man. Doctors look at these iPads like they're actual medical devices. You know, the kids are playing Angry Birds on it in the morning. <laughs> that afternoon, it's uh, at Starbucks, you know, sitting on a counter. And then in between all day, they're up on the floor doing rounds and going into patient rooms and, uh, you know, using it to view uh, scans and brain scans and DICOM images, they're called, and uh, PACS images. Very, very interesting area. Something that just came out recently is from a physical security perspective, the magnet on the side of an iPad case. Recently, there was an FDA report that came out. It had to do with a, 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 a stent that was in somebody's brain. The magnetic edge of the iPad case got close to it and changed the setting of a patient. So a doctor's sitting there, he's talking to a patient, yeah, 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 and all of a sudden this, this setting in this brain stent got changed simply because of magnetic edge on that iPad case. So, very, very interesting, you know, you don't, you don't think about that. Wow, oh, okay. So, from an uh, uh, industry perspective, you know, we're looking at a liability and uh, risk-averse culture, like, like to keep things quiet, who owns a problem. This is stuff we all know, right? Compliance focus differently from the, you know, the real security issue focus. If you walk out of here with one thing today, I want you to understand this Regal v. Medtronic. I'm not a lawyer, but this is my understanding of this case. If a medical device is FDA cleared, that limits the liability for that company in case there's an adverse outcome for that patient. They've got this locked up. This question of, you know, who's going to pay when a SCADA, uh, you know, something blows up like that gas explosion out in uh, San Bruno, California, who's going to pay for that? Where this, you know, where did this come from? I think that in many respects, it seems like the medical device community, manufacturing community, really locked this down and locked their life and limited their liability on this. What this also does, it places all the onus of setting regulatory requirements for security on the FDA. So the FDA is in a real pickle uh, because of this. And I think, if, you know, you see from a risk liability and risk and liability standpoint, Google Health, you know, discontinued it, right? I mean, if anybody could afford to go into this business of, you know, handling personal health data, you'd think that Google could do it, but, you know, obviously they don't want to do it they're, they're for a number of reasons. These academic researchers, these are the heavy hitters out there. These are who I consider are the real leaders, Dr. Kevin Fu and Dr. Uh, uh, Kono, uh, he goes by Yoshi. Uh, those two guys are the top, top cats right now. And uh, they have a website called securemedicine.org. I have that uh, link at the end. Those are really the, the guys who are driving stuff. And Kevin Fu, is, uh, he's a great guy too. He, and, and I tell you what, he's got a good hacker mentality. And he's got some balls, okay, because he likes telling these guys what it's, how it is and what the real problems are. And he's not just getting out there getting his grants and, uh, you know, racking up grad students. This guy really cares, so I like him a lot. This guy, Steve Hanna, on the bottom, he's a uh, student, but he did some really great work with uh, AEDs, okay, which, you know, when you go through the hospital, you see them all over the, or, I'm sorry, you go through an airport, you see them all over the place, right, AEDs. This guy did everything, you know, and, and you know, reverse engineered the firmware, uh, Ali debug, I mean, you know, buffer overflows, uh, malicious software upload, really great stuff. But there's academic researchers out there who are doing tangible academic uh, work. Kind of on our side, you know, this industry technical conference side, there's a, a couple guys, Jerome Radcliffe, he hacked his own uh, insulin pump. And then uh, these uh, two other guys, Tim Elrod and Stephen Morris, uh, Stephen Morris, uh, they did uh, fuzzing on some of these DICOM protocols and PAX uh, machines, which are basically imaging. So they're, you know, they take a CAT scan of you, it's a gigantic image. There's renderers and stuff, and they've been doing uh, fuzzing with that. So good solid work um, by these guys, and uh, hopefully they'll keep it up. One thing that's interesting you'll see with people getting access to medical devices, it's not easy to get them because uh, you know, they're prescription devices. So 
you can't just like go on the eBay and get, you can get some devices, but you can't get like a, you know, an insulin pump or something like that. Um, so what you see is a lot of uh, hackers are, and security researchers are going after their own equipment. So will it get worse before it gets better? I say we don't even know how bad it is now because the, the formal reporting uh, incidents is a really complex and tedious task and there's anecdotal self-reporting so there's FDA databases Maud and MedSun are the two main ones there's a new one that's coming out in September a year from now um, I mean they're really behind the ball on this the other major push the FDA is doing is to do a universal light ID uh, on all devices so all devices have like a serial number now but they want to have a universal identifier so that they can you know start to track these uh, devices from soup to nuts and what it is. One thing with these self-reports is you go into FDA mod and you do searches, there's typos in there. So, you know, I'm looking for viruses and I type, you know, conflicker and I'm, I get a few hits and then I type, I did a typo on my own I said conflicker. Okay, and I drop the L and I get, you know, like five more hits. So I'm like, well, you know, that's an eye opener right there. Okay, so because these are not getting embedded as far as the data entry goes, it's whoever writes these up, you know, sends them in, and then they get entered into the database. So there's a lot of weaknesses with that reporting. Um, and again, you know, we don't really know right now. Is it a flaw? Is it a bug? Is it an attack? You know, these are unique devices. Um, you have to have a lot of knowledge about them. And, uh, you know, I haven't seen NCASE come out with a medical device imaging software suite to do forensics on. You know, according to Dr. Kevin Fu, there's maybe two guys in the world right now or uh, forensic experts as far as medical devices go. So there might be a career opportunity down the road for you there. Here's the FDA MOD database. It stands for Manufacturer and User Facility Design Experience. They have these categories and these drop downs and stuff like that, but the best way you're gonna have to do this is go through it in free text. Um, people who do these data entry on here don't really uh, get into this, um, you know, the categorization of it. It's, it's, it's really not, it's, it's very poorly done, and it's poorly organized, and it's got a crappy search engine too. I've got a, a good workaround for you down, down here. So here's a search for buffer overflow, right? We got 25 hits in this for, for buffer overflow. And uh, like I said, the interface sucks. What you can do though, which is nice, is the FDA publishes these data. Okay, so plain text file, this database, you can go pull it down. I pull it down into a web server, and then do HD dig on it, right, which indexes it, and then create my own search engine. I've had actually better luck and, and better findings with this. Kevin Fu has his uh, minions, as he calls his grad students, um, doing a, a lot of work on these databases too, and they're crunching numbers. And actually, he's been an impetus to help the FDA move along and get that new database, which is coming out next year. Anybody remember this? McAfee? 2011, around uh, April 21st. They pushed out an update, which was uh, blue screening boxes, and actually not really blue screening, it was making them go into a continual, continual reboot. Killed us, okay? I mean, this really put patients at risk. Hospitals around the world were getting hosed up because of a bad Mac at the outlet. So when we think about this, like these are vendors, these are people, products that are gonna protect us. You know, they, some guy, some engineer at McAfee you know, was able to get this out and they didn't have a good process, and, and, and look what happens, you know? Thousands and thousands of, of hospitals were, were uh, impacted by this. Anybody here? This guy, remember this? Ghost Exodus? This guy was a Texas hospital down uh, Houston. He was a security guard, and he had all of his little hacker gear. He had his off crack CD, he had his backtrack, he had fake credentials and all this. He videotaped himself backdooring and uh, uh, infecting uh, HVAC systems at a hospital. And this is serious business, man. You mess with an HVAC system in a hospital, you can drop it a couple degrees and your medications go bad. I mean, aside from the money, now we got, you know, huge patient risk there that don't get their medications. This guy got home so hard by Wesley McGrew. It's written up in wire, it's a great read, it's a great story, and he's doing 10 years now down in a Texas jail, which I tell you, I wouldn't recommend that for anybody. So, it's going to get worse. It's going to get a lot worse, I think. This is the first time I've said cyber all day. <laughs> I know it's a DOD kind of thing, a whole cyber, but boy, I find it really annoying, that term. Um, 
But anyway, it's going to happen, I think, you know, looking at nation state and terrorism, <laughs> I think the, the digital double tap, okay, I was wondering if that domain name was taken, um, you know, as a, as a force multiplier, right? So you have a terrorist attack, okay, physical attack, and then they do electronic attack on the local hospitals. This is just the same thing that we always see in Israel, you know, a bomb goes off in the street, all the emergency people, you know, rescuers come in, first responders, and then the second one goes off, right? I mean, that's the same thing. The Americans do the same thing with the drone attacks. They hit a house, and then they wait, and then another 20 minutes later. 20 minutes later, when all the people come in, they hit it again. So, anecdotal stories coming out of that. Already happening now is uh, small doctor practices are getting broken into, and uh, the FBI, FBI in Chicago just uh, publishes, and uh, there's a doctor's office and they got hackers broke in, encrypted their database, said we want money or you're not getting your data back. They didn't do anything. They lost all their patient uh, data at that point and at that point they're, they're out of business. Now you think about this in the homogenous EHR systems, Epic Systems is a private company up in Madison, Wisconsin. Yeah. They have, <laughs> nice and cold up there, but they have um, one of the biggest market shares right now for EHR systems. The other biggies are like McKesson, and there's a, a Cerner is another one. Those are like the big three. But Epic has 150 million Americans in their databases right now. So across the country, hospitals are using these databases by, you know, these uh, EHR systems by Epic. And you think about this, this is almost like, you know, think about NIMDA or SQL Slammer or, you know, Code Red. You know, homogenous systems spread out across multiple locations. A worm gets developed for this, encrypts those databases. You know, we could have almost half the population of this country have their records, medical records, inaccessible, okay, because of a, a, a nasty focused attack. You know, it just makes me wonder if, if, you know, all these people advocating the cyber war, cyber attacks, and, you know, first strike capability. We're so soft over here. I, I, they're just, they need to work on a hospital for, for a year and then rethink their strategy. So what do you do about this? Mm. What's in it for you? What can you do? What are you interested in? I say apps. There are thousands and thousands of medical apps. Great opportunity here. You can get some of these. Um, anybody see uh, uh, Thomas Richards talk this morning? <laughs> really? Hung over. I actually made it to it. It was 9:30 this morning, but he he, he basically had a uh, Android-based app that he was using for uh, remote nurses uh, to do home health care. So their patient data, they're entering data on, then they sync up, you know, back with this vendor. A couple million dollars for this app. He went through it, found a bunch of problems. They brought it to the vendor, and the vendor said, "Sorry, you had to find that. They already knew about the issues. We got this plan to get fixed in three quarters from now." So. They don't care. Totally unencrypted. They said they are using 128-bit encryption. No. no. No SSL for the upload. No nothing. Okay, you need two pieces of information. You need the server name and a server ID and that you could actually connect to it. It was just a horrible, horrible thing. What we really need to do is we really need to see more vendor pain and public embarrassment. That's the only thing that these guys get. You can try to talk to them. <laughs> you know, you just gotta you just gotta take it to cert and uh, take it to the vendor and, and make it public. I, I, you just gotta bring the pain, that's, that's it. You gotta cost them money. Why target mobile apps? It's so accessible to you. You can go to you know, the Android store, you can go to the Apple store, you can download, and a lot of these apps are, you know, maybe a personal blood pressure monitoring thing where you, know, you just you know, enter in your, your data for your blood pressure reading every day. Um, whatever it is, but there's, there's tools out there, um, and uh, there's good docs like the OWASP Mobile Top 10. Anybody know about that? First time I heard of that was today. This is what you can look for. Look for the personal information disclosure, see if you can rewrite, modify, destroy, you know, and then, like I said, send your books to certain. This is how you can make, make yourself famous. You go do, you know, a month of medical lab books, and then take that to a conference. You're going to have companies coming in and saying, how do we hire you? you know, we're, we're interested in eBay medical devices, lots of stuff. These are all images I got off of eBay, and these are all devices uh, that you can purchase. Not really the tactic I'd recommend. You really don't know what you're getting. Um, you're, if you look 
test on this and find vulnerabilities. It's kind of a one-off, and uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm just not sure you're going to get a whole lot of traction. There, there, there may be cases where it's worthwhile, but maybe not. So what are we going to see? I think we're going to see more of these personal medical devices, guys getting a hold of their own stuff. Um, you know, you get an insulin pump, and uh, you know, some hacker gets a hold of it, he, he knows what he's doing, and uh, starts doing analysis on it. eBay equipment. Academics, these guys are getting this gear. I know they are, um, for, the, for a fact, but they're all under heavy MDA. So the vendors, you know, they, they lock them down. So you'll never see, you may see an academic at a conference like this, but pretty unlikely. Home medical equipment, when one of these Intel PHS systems, you know, hits the United States and uh, 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 a DEF CON, you know, level hacker gets a hold of it, uh, I'd love to see one of these show up at DEF CON. And uh, I know that their CISO just left too for that Intel home health healthcare uh, company. So it's actually a, an offshoot of Intel. I don't know why he left, but who knows. And then uh, I think we'll see these crypto functions. One other cool thing is uh, these medical device data collectors. There's a lot of um, medical devices around the, country, around, I'm sorry, around the hospital. And what they're doing is they're, they're sending their data to these data collectors. And then these data collectors then kind of funnel that information to the, to the electronic health record system. So I think those are Shodan, show of hands, Shodan, anybody know that? I think we'll see sure I was going to go through some Shodan stuff, but um, I actually already dealt with that a little bit on some vendors and uh, some other talk. So resources, medical device, uh, um, security center, I mentioned that, that's securemedicine.org, that's Kevin Fru's site. MedSec group on LinkedIn, please uh, come check it out. Here's the FDA databases. You just do Google, Google search for the FDA databases, you'll see that. And then uh, that's me, my contact information, Sean Murr. Questions? I know I had a lot of slides, I went through this quickly, but you know, you see the shirt, I'm around, so after it's fine too. Yes, sir. Um, from my personal experience working for a medical device manufacturer, a lot of the problems that uh, we've encountered is the FDA approval cycle for software patches. I mean, most medical devices have a bit of uh, maintenance cycle they go through, but then you also have every single software change that goes into a medical device has to go through a whole huge FDA red tape. So what's what's you know, anything that's being done there. Yeah, there's a, there's actually been some FDA clarification and back and forth on that with this patching business, and it basically comes down to a verbiage thing. They say if it doesn't significantly impact the medical side, the medical functionality of that, then you know the end users are allowed to patch that and are able to patch that. So what you're getting at there is you know this this approval process I mentioned before, it's 510K, onerous, it takes some years, a lot of money, a lot of documentation, real nuisance. The worry is, is that you know, we've gone through this process, we've got this approved. Now we've got these patches we want to put on this box. But the problem is, is that we need to go through this whole FDA approval process again. That's not the case. FDA has put out, actually, go back to that 2005 COTS guidance document. They address that. There's a guy named uh, Fitzgerald, uh, works at the Radiological uh, Device Center at the FDA, and he's really the guy who's uh, um, crafted that that policy. You know what? then that would make sense. I stopped supporting those devices back in 2005, 2006, but that was always the big issue that we had was a new new update rolled out and it was all liability. Those uh, same issues are going on right now with um, um, with the uh, with the antivirus. Next question, sir. Uh, so things like that uh, Intel PH6000 device yeah. you're talking about, um, presumably if that was to be brought stateside, there would be some HIPAA compliance issues related to that, like they'd have to can you talk a little bit about that? Like, does that mean it has to encrypt a certain level, or HIPAA doesn't really cover that much detail? HIPAA HIPAA's a monster. Okay. Thankfully, in my current position, I don't have to deal with that too much. Um, I'm able to uh, sidestep some of those HIPAA um, activities that are that are taking place. So, short answer, no. I can't really speak to that. Okay. But yes, there will be you know, uh, guidelines and requirements that they'll have to meet. But it's like anything else; they'll screw it up. <laughs> you know, uh, you're gonna, you know, Ever like the you optimist. Said, <laughs> uh, after that stuff that HD Moore, you know, talked about, it's like, oh, you know, we, the X works, right? Two hundred fifty thousand now. They knocked it down to two hundred thousand devices that are vulnerable. You know, it's 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 pretty scary. Any other questions? Okay, thank you for your time. I'll be Thanks. around. And, uh,
No, 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 I'm sorry. I don't need to answer.